forget whatever it was you were doing before, create some space now for this discussion. And to lead us in an invocation, we're, good, we're so delighted to have Sister Pat Daly. A little bit about Sister Pat. She's a Dominican sister of Caldwell, New Jersey, and the executive director of the Tri-State Coalition for Responsible Investment. For the past 35 years, Sister Pat has been one of ICCR's most active members, leading shareholder advocacy campaigns on virtually every social and environmental issue and across nearly every business sector. Her legendary work promoting corporate sustainability and climate change mitigation began in the late in the 1980s, and this year, she was the recipient of the prestigious Series Trillium Joan Bavaria Award. A leader by example, a valued colleague, and a mentor to ICCR's next generation, we continue to be inspired by Sister Pat's wisdom and her commitment to justice. I invite all of us just to take a moment of silence to truly have our hearts and minds and our own spirits um, centered in this room, conscious of our gracious God. Creating God, known by so many names, we stand in wonder at the profound mystery of the 13.8 billion year journey of your cosmos. We are in awe at every molecule and atom of this sacred planet. You call us to take seriously the responsibility and care of your creation. Enable us to live with mindfulness and possess sensibly. We especially recall the communities around this planet who are at risk and are already impacted by climate change. We recall the anguish of the people of the prophets in our faith traditions as their insights and warnings for justice and right dealings fell on deaf ears. We passionately pray for the conversion of the hearts and minds of men and women in positions of power. We pray the conversion of those who resist the responsibility to shift our carbon economy and refuse to finance new economic models that will sustain your creation and the future generations of all species. We pray for bankers and all investors here that we will be unflinching in the commitment to invest in and to finance carbon-free solutions and adaptations. We pray for the enlightened executives with us here today who have already brought us new technologies, practices, and commitments to reduce our carbon footprint. We pray that your spirit will move us to daring and courageous decisions to align business strategies to honor and protect the commons and reduce greenhouse gas emissions. Empower them, empower us, inspire us. Let the people say, amen. So good afternoon, everyone. My name is Father Seamus Finn. I'm the, uh, an oblate of Mary Immaculate, but uh, chair of the board of ICCR, and uh, happy to welcome you all this afternoon. First of all, on behalf of all of the ICCR members and our numerous partners and colleagues and collaborators and co-conspirators, um, and thank you. Uh, thank you for coming. Thank you for your support for your generosity, uh, for your challenges, for participating in our 
ongoing work uh, so clearly and so importantly elaborated in our opening prayer. What a place to be, right? Movie sets, entertainers, plays. I'm not quite sure what, and it's, as some of you know, it's pretty dangerous to give me a stage like this, uh, but uh, we'll try. So 40 years on, uh, the network of ICCR continues to grow, uh, and the themes and the topics and the issues that come into our conversations and to our table uh, continue to invite new energy, new members, and new opportunities. And we're delighted to share that with you. This is the second event I'm celebrating this week in New York and had the pleasure on Tuesday night of celebrating the 50th anniversary of the Center for Migration Studies, founded by the Scalabrini Fathers on Staten Island, down at the celebrated Battery Park, down at the tip of Manhattan. And it reminded me that as we continue to grow and to share journey uh, together. Uh, migration is so much a part of that. The challenges that come with that continue to remain with us, and we're all in some ways connected to that, as is the theme and topic of today's event. So things like words like globalization and ecosystems and bioregions are maybe a little new to us, looking at nuance, looking at ways for them to fit into our conversations, because We've heard about them from our colleagues in the field, we've read about them, and we have experienced them, especially in the theme and topic of today's event. So I don't have a lot more to do, except, as I said, to welcome you all, to thank you so much for being here, and maybe to tell just a quick joke, since I probably shouldn't sing a song, right? <laughs> Well, the joke is really a simple. I'm borrowing it from Cardinal Dolan, where I heard it recently, and it's about not jumping to conclusions. And, you know, he was tell talking about a famous bishop in New York whose uh, administrative assistant came to him and said, Bishop, you know, my husband is really not keeping up his part of the bargain, and he's, you know, sloughing off on the job and drinking too much, not taking responsibility at home wondering if it's possible that you, you know, might stop by and have a chat with him, you know, a nice pastoral chat. And Bishop said, well, it's not really something that I do, and uh, it's kind of awkward, and, but if the opportunity presents itself, maybe I will. So he's walking the street one day, and anyway, he's going, well, maybe this is a good time to stop in and see if Tom's at home. So he knocks on the door and says, come in, come in. And there's Tom, Pouch, uh, couch potato before that term probably was, was, uh, was coined, lying on the couch with a bag of potato chips and talking to the television and said, oh, Bishop, come in. Nice to see you. Great. He said, oh, by the way, Bishop, uh, what is the gout? And he said, that's a strange question, really surprising. Well, he said, it's, you know, it's something that you pick up from eating rich food and drinking too much and not much exercise and, you know, obesity and things like that. And Bishop's saying, this is a great entree for me now to introduced the subject that uh, I'm supposed to be discussing here. And he said, and he said, and Tom, exactly, why do you ask that question? He said, well, I just list, heard on the radio that the Cardinal has the gout. <laughs> so there you go. We're moving on to the Legacy Award. The Legacy Award for ICCR is an award given by the Board of uh, Directors of ICCR for, to honor uh, members and collaborators and folks that are co-conspirators who have been active and exem have exemplified the work, the mission, uh, and, the, uh, and the continued engagement in our work. And we are clearly delighted today to be able to present this award as we have in years past. And I'm going to introduce Mr. Gwen Ferry, who's going to come up here and introduce uh, today's uh, Legacy Award recipient. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Last June, when we were at Federal Way, we were invited to consider nominating someone for the 2014 Legacy Award. And I looked around the room and saw a former awardee and several wonderful potential candidates. But then I saw Sister Nora Nash, and I knew it had to be Nora. Yeah. Sister 
Sister Nora is a member of the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia, a community like many others who rely on investments to support their ministries and also to care for their elderly and ill sisters. Uh, as, as Nora says, we expect social returns as well as financial returns. I first met Nora 10 years ago when I became the representative for my community at ICCR. And the following summer, Nora and, and her community welcomed us to Aston for the annual meeting. And we cannot forget the wonderful welcome by that wonderful mime. The first issue that I was with Nora was uh, violent video games. Nora, with several of you, had acted with uh, Take Two, other producers and uh, uh, retailers to about their concern of the accessibility of these videos, games, for young children. But Nora also wrote a, an article for the NCEA Journal, the National Catholic Education Association, urging teachers and parents to be aware of the potential danger of their children playing these games, not only for their values, but their potential changing their behavior. Nora has been, if you look on the ICCR website at the database, you'll see that Nora has been involved in over 700 actions, dialogues, and resolutions. <laughs> all about various uh, um, human rights issues and environmental protection. Nora has been interviewed by several publications, including the New York Times. And as you know, she is one of the 10 sisters featured in Joe Piazzi's book, If Nuns Rule the World. <laughs> I am honored and privileged to be able to present this proposal. This proposal has been submitted by the Interfaith Center on Corporate Responsibility, 475 Riverside Drive, Suite 1842, New York, New York, 10115, the owner of 1,971 shares of stock. Resolved that the stockholders of all publicly held U.S. corporations acknowledge the contributions of Sister Nora Nash, OSF, for her work on behalf of vulnerable people throughout the world to ensure more just and sustainable corporations. Supporting statement. For Sister Nora, the Franciscan gift of relationship is a call to stay at the table with an active and listening ear to always be open to conversation and wherever possible to create a more just and equitable society. Sister Nora has shared this gift of relationship with her fellow ICCR members and with the many corporate representatives she engages in her role as Director of Corporate Responsibility for her congregation, the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia. Together with Associate Director Tom McKinney, she has challenged Kroger over the rights of farm workers, Hershey's over child labor, Anadarko and Chevron on hydraulic fracturing, Walmart on wages, raise corporate awareness of their social impacts. We have to speak for those who cannot speak for themselves, says Sister Nora. Many who meet Sister Nora are immediately disarmed by her gentle nature and her humility. However, there is nothing gentle about her commitment to social justice <laughs> and her passionate defense of communities negatively impacted by corporate practices is legendary at ICCR. Said Tom McKinney, what's always stood out to me about Sister Nora 
is that even among our colleagues at ICCR, these women and men of such faith, intelligence, and dedication, she's known to always bring the shareholder issue back to the rights of the people. Justice for the most vulnerable best describes her work with ICCR. Board of Directors recommendation. The Board of Directors recommends that the share owners vote for this proposal. I say thank you. Thank you all very much. I do accept this Legacy Award on behalf of the Sisters of St. Francis of Philadelphia, my associate, Tom McKaney, and all of those out there who are my ICCR heroes. <laughs> when Seamus called, you know, Seamus is a, an Irish man like I'm an Irish woman. He, I'm from Limerick and he's from Cork. And when he called me to tell me that I was receiving this award, I was flabbergasted and said, it cannot be. <laughs> I tried to convince him that there were many others more worthy of this award. And I did name many of you out in the audience tonight, all those who have been my heroes. And he said to me, you all have lots of time. So <laughs> what does that tell you about me? <laughs> But I would say definitely I am honored and I am humbled. Thank you to the ICCR board. I'd like them to stand because nobody has recognized them yet. ICCR board members, thank you. Laura Berry, our executive director. The very dedicated staff. I would like ICCR staff to stand up. All, all the members, members of ICCR, stand up. You are accepting this award with me. Associates, affiliates, and our friends, corporate sponsors, please stand. I know I met many of you. Look at that, corporations that have joined us, thank you. And I'm including the corporations in everything I say, because I believe that we are inspired by faith and committed to action. That is our calling card. And I have been inspired by many of you for many years and your commitment to ICCR. Beginning with Tim Smith, Paul Neuhauser, Tim and Paul. For those who are not aware, they're our founding leaders. I also would like today to remember a woman that I really admired, who worked so hard for ICCR. Many of you know who it is, many may not. Barbara Lendon, a nurse line sister. And I honor all those who have been part of ICCR for more than 15 years. I say you are my role models and you are my hero. I would be very remiss today if I didn't give a special shout out to Sister Marie Lucy. Marie. Uh, she and several of you here, and I'm sure uh, many Pat Daly and Barbara Ayers, were a part of the, the original group. And I know that you really chartered those early days of shareholder advocacy and alternative investing. In 1992, you, Marie Lucy and your group, you convinced Jack Welsh, CEO 
of GE to fly his helicopter to our mother house to discuss nuclear weapons and economic conversion. We were talking about economic conversion the other day, so the, the call goes on for e Barbara Ayers is part of that, and I'm sure any, any others. Uh, we actually uh, continue to work on the economic conversion. Marie Lucy and Pat Marshall, who was one of our great leaders, enabled TRF. If you're not familiar with TRF, TRF is the, um, I know it went, the reinvestment uh, fund in Philadelphia. And they helped to get it started because they were beginning board members. Today, TRF is one of the greatest CDFIs in the country. It manages $738 million and distributes $1.3 billion to community investments. On the 20th anniversary of TRF, they honored Marie and Pat Marshall for enabling the organization to get started. And it has done a lot of work in schools. So they had a school play and the school play was entitled, The House That Jack Built. <laughs> you know that Marie stood up right away and said, no, it is not the house that Jack built, it is the house that Jack and Jill built. <laughs> Thank you, Marie, for not only helping to build TRF, but for your lifelong commitment to justice and, speed and peace and inspiring me to do likewise. Uh, at a particular annual meeting four years ago, ICCR had four resolutions, and that's not unusual. At that particular meeting, which was down in Richmond, Virginia, so you can place it, I won't name the company, but shareholders in the audience mocked us and ridiculed us, I'm sure Mike and Kathy and Marianne, if you were here, because they presumed that we were a conspiracy. <laughs> and you could hear conspiracy, conspiracy, conspiracy reverberating all around us. And a gentleman next to me was looking at me and he said, like, conspiracy. I was getting a little bit scared. <laughs> the chairman of that meeting would say, out of order, out of order, out of order. They'd stop and then they'd go back to doing the same thing. But what I want to say today very definitively, no, we're not a conspiracy. And 99% of corporate brothers and sisters are fully aware of that. Our work with most corporations is an opportunity to conspire together on any issue that causes injustice, violates human rights, and the common good. We will continue to conspire and inspire when we are called to protect people who are subjected to extreme poverty, food insecurity, trafficking, slave labor, violence, and militarism, and smoking in movies, which was a resolution that Tom McKinney did last week. <laughs> We will conspire and inspire action against environmental injustices of any kind that damage or contaminate the land we live on, the water we drink, and the air we breathe. We will conspire and inspire when financial greed, predatory lending, land grabbing, and corporate lobbying rob people of their rights and homes. We will conspire and inspire with our corporate brothers and sisters whenever there is any possibility of working for systemic change. Robert Kennedy reminded us of that when he said, few will have the greatness to bend history itself, but each of us can work to change a small portion of events. It is from numberless diverse acts of courage and belief that human history is shaped. Each time a man or woman stands up for an ideal or acts to improve the lot of others or strikes out against injustice, he or she 
sends forth a tiny ripple of hope that can sweep down the mightiest walls of oppression and resistance. Amid all the pending world problems and the moral imperative to act boldly to care for our planet and weather the storm, Mother Frances, our foundress, would say, no risk, no gain. Thank you. So you get a great glimpse of why my job is so easy with uh, honorees and collaborators like Nora uh, in working with us each day and all of the other members who are here. So thank you again. Uh, without further ado, I'll introduce our executive director, uh, Laura Berry. Well, so we all know that it's a beautiful conspiracy. And what a crowd, what a crowd. It's such a treat to be up here with you today. And the good news is, the folks who so wonderfully came before me basically said so many of the things that I'd hope to say that my speech is gonna be mercifully, mercifully short. So for those of you that have been listening to me up here for the last eight years, um, rest assured, I'll be quick. But I do want to offer special thanks to our legacy awardee, Sister Nora Nash. Although I recognize that our little local paper, the New York Times, has declared Sister Nora a, I love this, nun who won't stop nudging. <laughs> I wanna offer my gratitude for the way you nudge me. You nudge us all. You help us weather every storm, and you've helped me weather a few with your incomparable mix of wit, compassion, and, dare I say, ferocity. Thank you, Sister Nora, from all of us. We are so pleased to acknowledge your work today. Once again. Since this is the largest group I've ever gathered for an ICCR event, look around, you all, you keep getting bigger and bigger every year. I really need to ask the first time attendees, especially because it's kind of dark here in the COPA, would the first time attendees just stand up and wave their program so we can look around and make sure to make you all feel welcome? Very good. Thank you so much for joining us today. We hope to see a lot more of you in the future. I was going to ask for my usual list of stand up and let us thank you, but Sister Nora did that so much better than I ever could have. So let me thank the ICCR Governing Board, the wonderful ICCR staff, our amazing members, and let me not forget the corporate sponsors who make this work possible. You make this work possible not only with your financial support, but with the fact that you are the courageous, dare I say, co-conspirators, who sit at the table with us even when it's uncomfortable, even when we may be bringing challenges that perhaps we don't agree on, but you're there, you're there at the table, you engage in dialogue, and you have the faith that will in fact help us weather the storm. You're a model for the entire corporate sector. Throughout its 43 year history, ICCR has been a pioneer, anticipating issues that are just beyond the horizon of corporate attention. But when it comes to climate change, our members have always been at the forefront of the conversation, pressing forward when very few investors and very few corporations were listening. The work of leaders like Sister Pat Daly, Tim Smith, Father Michael Crosby, and so many others 
continues to be the launch pad for our optimism that we can, in fact, weather the storm. A few years back, Vice President Al Gore got our collective attention with a film he called An Inconvenient Truth. Since that time, New Yorkers have weathered a number of once-in-a-century storms, including Sandy. In fact, many of you who have attended ICCR's regular conferences have had some truly inconvenient weather disruptions. For our first-time attendees, you may not realize that we've actually changed our venue this year. Please know how hard it is for me to resist singing the song. I promised I wouldn't. We tried to get Barry Manilow. He was busy in Vegas. So our favorite spot at South, South Street Seaport has been shuttered a minor inconvenience compared with the far more devastating consequences to people around our planet. With the support of everyone gathered today and the help of the many communities you represent, we will harness our faith and our smarts to weather these storms. Each year, I share my hope that everyone will be challenged, inspired, and perhaps invigorated by the shared wisdom of this afternoon's speakers. The ICCR has been talking about climate change for, what, nearly 30 years, which is just extraordinary. It's like an original um, clarion call to all of us. And so what we want to do as a panel is catalyze um, the kind of talk about transformative innovation. I mean, you all know what the risks are if we don't do anything. And um, so we want to talk about what investors can do proactively to help communities adapt, and what we can do in terms of incentivizing radical change. And um, I was struck by um, Paul Pullman, Unilever's um, opening, the opening ceremony of, of Climate Week, saying, I'm an optimist because it's too late to be a pessimist. <laughs> and I think that's really, um, really important to, to think that way, that we don't want to leave people with despair that we want to leave them with um, inspiration about what can all of us do um, as you know, people on the planet um, in terms of preparing. Um, and so I want to start with Christina, if I, if I may. Just what should companies and investor, investors do, thinking about that word optimism, um, proactively to help communities adapt to climate change? Well, there's so much that, that can be done. Um, I would say the first thing to do is to ask the climate question. Um, to ask about, okay, what are, what are emissions like? What are consequences of these investments? But also, what is the climate risk that, that investments face? And to not just think about it in terms of the physical footprint or um, the, the hard infrastructure or investment itself, but the communities that are involved. And, and maybe just a little example to illustrate what, what I mean by that. This is something I got from one of our partners, um, an engineer who's been working all over the world on, on various issues of climate resilience, disaster resilience. And uh, she worked with a, a car company uh, in, in Turkey that uh, designed a seismic proof uh, manufacturing facility, a factory. And lo and behold, uh, an earthquake did happen. Um, their competitor, the factory was flattened, absolutely destroyed, went out of business. This company that invested the extra money that it took to make their factory seismic proof survived. But as she pointed out to them, had the earthquake occurred at night, they would have been out of business. Why? Because their entire population lives in sub, the uh, worker population lives in substandard housing and would have been decimated by this earthquake. And so it's, 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 it's about thinking more broadly and, and thinking about climate impacts and other, other chronic stresses, seismic impacts and the like, that might be relevant. And not just the footprint of the investment, but think beyond that to the communities that, that depend on and that we depend on for, for all that we do produce and, and services that we provide. So I would say ask the climate question. Well, the Rockefeller Foundation is also very good at listening. And you do a lot of listening, and you go to communities all over. And you go to these small communities, and you find by listening that they have very big ideas. So um, I would love for you to share an example of some of your, um, your heroes out there who are sure. making a difference. 
Yeah, so I've been honored to be working uh, as a part of the Asian Cities Climate Change Resilience Network, which is a network that Rockefeller helped start seven years ago, which is, is working in partnership with secondary cities in South and Southeast Asia. These are the cities where the bulk of population growth is, is going. Um, and bringing together multi-stakeholder partnerships to look at what are the climate risks that they face and what can they do about it. Um, and this involves everyone from the local universities, climate scientists, civil society networks, slum dwellers organizations, chambers of commerce, um, all coming together to share their ideas. And what they have is a lot of ideas. Um, there's not a dearth of what to do. It's really a, a matter of sorting through them and negotiating what should be done first, what should be done next, and how to take forward these ideas. And, and what I've seen through this is, is incredible leadership. And um, I'm thinking of one of our partners in, in particular, a young woman who works with Mercy Corps um, named Ratri Sutarto in, in Indonesia, who the local government of, of Semarang, a, a city in, in, in Indonesia, the local government now turns to her for advice on how to handle climate issues and what they should do next and how to implement several of the initiatives that, that they're rolling out. Everything from rainwater harvesting um, to real-time salinity monitoring of, of their water because they're seeing it get more and more saline over time. Um, and she's all 28. You can follow her on Twitter. Um, she's, she's now a, an expert in this field. You have to share the Twitter handle. It's okay. I will. We'll later. get it later. We'll get it later. Okay. okay. And Paul, um, I'd love to get your insights about whether or not you're seeing more of a can-do attitude from corporations that you work with, companies who are um, not fighting it, but who are being innovative. And you know, what are some examples, maybe some smaller examples, not the Elon Musk, Tesla examples that we all know, but you know, some, who should we be paying attention to? It's a, very, it's a very complicated problem, climate change. Um, and I just wanted to, to, to uh, honor I, ICCR and uh, the extraordinary achievements. Um, you know, CDP has had the privilege to represent ICCR members for 12 years now. And I think it was Churchill said that uh, you were the lion and we just gave you the roar. So thank you very much. For the... I think you've got a lot of lionesses out here also. <laughs> lionesses. Just to be right, clear. Right. Well, on, on the subject of... <laughs> <laughs> well, on the subject of lionesses, it's great to be Sister Pat, who yes. I sat with 11 years ago, and Laura, and my gurus, like, actually, Helen Wildsmith, who I'm going to pick on a little bit, my, my friend from the UK, uh, my gurus. Uh, just one thing, Helen perfectly typifies, I think, this nexus of moral and investment authority. Just a small case study, I know um, that we have a predatory lender in the UK called Wonga, which is British slang for, for cash. And it's sold to a lot of really poor people, very high interest loans, like, like loan sharks, but like a big company. And Helen was very much involved in organizing uh, a, 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 the church's campaigns in response. Today, Wonga has written off 330,000 loans wow. and written off 220 million of debt to the poorest people in the UK. Wow. That's the yeah. power yeah. of wow. the moral yeah. Guys out there okay, well, know about. I mean, I think, it, for me, one of the key issues is I think we've lost politics, okay? Um, Secretary Kerry, uh, the, you know, the, the Secretary of State of the, of the U.S., said on Monday, um, I was going to get a, a, a bill through to, to, to regulate this terrible problem, and he, he kept talking about how terrible the problem was, I, I won't repeat it here, but he said, um, coal went on TV and scared me. And so there's, 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 a, there's a, one of the most senior U.S. politicians saying that, that, that the country can't pass a law anymore because of, because of lobbying by corporations. So, I mean, I just noticed companies leaving um, ALEC, which is the American Legislative uh, Council. Um, uh, Occidental Petroleum, this week, it has pulled out. We're starting to see movements of people saying, OK, this isn't a game. This is national security. We're not going to oppose the government in its sacred duty to protect the people. That looks to me like a very important part of it. What do you want all of us, this group, and to do before next year in Paris? What can we do in terms of individual efforts? I 
think that this, the corporate lobbying thing is critical. I think we have to absolutely ensure that, the, that, that no board thinks of using shareholders' funds to oppose the efforts by the government to protect the people. That's number one. And then secondarily, just to support the, the, the proliferation of this new economy. You know, climate change is like the internet. It's how we're going to do things in the future. We're going to we're have new industries and new opportunities. We can talk more about that. But to be highlighting that narrative and leading the mainstream investment community as this group so brilliantly does. Well, the recent poll of consumers internationally shows what, what is it in terms of how consumers want to spend their money? Well, I think it's, the, it's this notion of turkeys voting for Christmas. You know, in, in the end, all consumers are citizens, and most citizens have got children, and people with children have a responsibility. And I think that the, the price to protect your children, no price is too high. Everybody wants that. <laughs> The study, there was, a, there was a survey that was done, though, by um, uh, a big survey. You mentioned it to me. Like 50% of, it's more than 50% of consumers now have come around. It kind of depends um, how you ask the question. Okay. If you want to say something That's like, right. do you want to pay more for green stuff? Everyone <laughs> says no. And if you say, do you want to invest in a safe future for your children? Everyone says yes. <laughs> right. That's exactly right. I remember doing a story um, back in the early 80s with, um, about shopping for a better world. And it was just a little story going out. And there were some metrics that were said about um, whether or not there, were, um, there was diversity on the board and the environment and um, you know, various seven different things, perhaps. And we went shopping in a supermarket with the daughter of the person who had done the, done the book. Uh, and what amazed me about it was coming back and doing the story just for the, e for the evening news. And afterwards, the cameramen in the studio and the people in the control room who don't care about anything normally, they've seen it all in kind of dull, and saying, now, which company was it that was good in terms of investing in the community? And which one was the one that was green? Can, can I look at that? You know, I think that consumers really do want to do the right thing. And this, the recent poll that you told me about is that they'll spend more. That they will spend more for the company that is doing right. I think you, know, you can talk about all kinds of problems with democracy, members of political parties falling, turnouts and elections falling. You can see a growing awareness that actually citizens, um, maybe they're overwhelmed, or maybe they see how they invest their money and how they spend their money. That is the big global democracy. And once again, ICCR shows the kind of um, the most exciting manifesto for that. We have started working on this component of the adaptation. Working around agriculture, sustainable adaptive agriculture, which looks at enhancing and retaining soil quality. This is absolutely essential. Working on harvesting the water and then using the water well in terms of what we call in the villages as water budgeting, water management, using micro-irrigation, working around livelihoods, and what we have found, and green livelihoods, livelihoods where people have an alternative, that is, they have livelihoods not only that are climate dependent, but those that are not climate dependent because they can fall back on something. And what we have re realized over the years is that the past few years and earlier, is that a very systematic way of doing land uh, restoration of the watersheds, re, uh, reforestation, has brought in a lot of positive impacts. And what I would like to say is, there are positive ways in which communities are benefiting. And if you want to see a place where you can make a change, it is in these communities where people do see dreams and hopes because their agriculture has improved, because water has come into villages, and I'm talking, sorry, about the semi-arid areas. In these semi-arid areas, in spite of the changes in the weather pattern, because we have agromet advisories, now farmers are able to take precaution a day or two earlier because they, got, they get very real-time data and I have to say from the Indian Meteorological Department that they service our villages very directly. And we have been able to get the farmers to take action for some of the things beforehand. I have to say for some of the things because there are some disasters we are not yet able to face.
We still have to work around how to handle it. What kind of public and private partnerships do you envision in terms of proactively addressing the rural areas? See, I think we all are affected by climate change. Because our foods come from the rural areas, our waters come from there. Corporate, corporates need the water. They need the food for a lot of things. And working together, in India, we look at the corporates to support us with their corporate social responsibility fund to partner with us when we partner together with the rural communities and with public funds coming from the government in a kind of a, what we call a PPCP model, a public-private community partnership. And we have done it with some of the corporates in India. And uh, very few, I have to say. But we think that this is a model where we can work a lot more together. And you've got to describe this, um, you know, you're catalyzing creative irritants in an atmosphere of relaxed tension. <laughs> I love that. What does it mean? <laughs> well, I have to say that our co-founder, Father Herman Barker, is a Swiss Jesuit who has always been rich in, philo in philosophy, and he is the one who has brought this from its uh, Hegelian dialectic. And we realize that when we work together, you know, when we are so many of us coming to the table, each one of us as individuals or as individual institutions have our own agenda as a priority. And when we have to come together, it's then that we, you know, begin to say, how can I get more than the other? And that is where the creative irritants come in each of us seeking from our own, which is good, and which is sometimes not so good. But we need an outside factor to trigger us coming together. And that is where we need an external catal catalyst. Sometimes for us, you know, we would have to be a catalyst in the rural communities to get the high caste and the low caste, the rich and the poor, the better endowed and the less endowed to come together. It is a huge challenge, you know? So, but triggering them to come over a common future agenda and to bring all of us into a dialogue and then see what is this win-win we have to work towards. It means it's working towards a win-win. It also means that we have to challenge our own orthodoxy and our pet ideas that we have grown up with and the known experiences we've had to think differently, to make a, a, a different way and a different approach because what has worked so far may not work tomorrow. So therefore, there is this give and take that is this democratic process and always towards a common and a sustainable good for us and our generations to come. And Christina, the Rockefeller Foundation is um, in a position to take bold risks. Um, what are some of the bold risks that, um, that we don't know about that you've been taking? Yeah, a, a couple things come to mind. I want to pick up on the idea of a catalyst and opening up a space, because that's often what, what we see as missing and, and see as our role, to help open up the space for dialogue to bring different partners together. Um, and, and, and that's what we've done through our Asian cities work, through some of our work here domestically as well. Um, and most recently launched a, a, a partnership with uh, USAID and the Swedish International a a Development Agency called the Global Resilience Partnership. It's, with a huge investment it's of 150 million, 150 million dollars. Um, there's a challenge right now that's open to deal with some chronic resilience challenges in the Horn of Africa in South and Southeast Asia um, so that we can stop investing so much in the future in humanitarian response missions and be able to invest proactively today to prevent, to prevent disasters and present, prevent suffering and, and destruction and, and bounce back even quicker. And this is a very loosely structured um, challenge. We're asking for people, um, partnerships to come together to involve uh, the communities in the Global South and some of these hotspot areas, 
to generate solutions over time. But the, the initial funding is just to bring people together to, to, to further brainstorm and develop a solution. Because we know that there's, there's a lack of um, funding and space, really, to, to generate these new ideas and innovate on, on these very persistent challenges. So, so that's why we've taken this kind of bold and, and creative step, I think, of, of confronting this challenge this way as opposed to saying, you know, this is the problem and we're looking for someone who can fund it, uh, who can solve it, come tell us what, what you're going to do. Um, and then uh, on, on the investment side, um, we're, we're very proud of what our brothers um, and sisters at Rockefeller Brothers uh, announced last week in terms of their divestment from oil and gas and, and the Rockefeller family as well. Um, our endowment uh, is less than 2% in oil and gas, and it's been that way for years, I'm, I'm proud to say. And we've actually increased our investment in climate positive um, investments, things like clean energy, clean tech, forestry, and the like. We've, we've increased that over time, um, and our endowment is doing great. So I'm, I'm proud to say that it's, it's, it's uh, climate friendly and uh, lucrative as well. So that's the macro impact that you can have in terms of investing in, in green. Um, what about in, on a personal level? I know that you've done a lot of soul searching, that you travel a lot. That's how you caught that cold, I'm yes, sure. Yes, I on caught an that cold somewhere. on the plane. Um, so just thinking about greenhouse yeah. gases and your carbon footprint. Yeah. Hmm. I, I, I divulge that I have the biggest carbon footprint of anyone at the Rockefeller Foundation, which is ironic being the climate person. Um, and that's, that's really made me reflect on, am I doing more good or am I doing more bad? Um, and you know, I think that's a good tension to have and a good reflection for each of us to have, no matter what we do, is, is what's the net impact and how can we boost the good and decrease the bad that, that sometimes is coincident with with what we do and how we live our lives. Um, well, on the way over here, I, there was a big sign that was put in my face, right, you know, at Broadway and 42nd Street, repent. So I obviously <laughs> have a lot of soul searching to do on my own. But Paul, what about you, what, in terms of thinking about your own carbon footprint? I think it's important to, to, to try and see what you can do. Um, you know, air travel is important. It's, it's a big thing, actually. It's a, it's a major problem. Uh, air fuel is not taxed, which is a disaster. Um, so that means that uh, you know, when you buy a ticket, a lot of ga a lot of the cash goes directly into into climate change. Um, you know, on the one hand, uh, I mean, I wouldn't you know normally say this, but I feel like I'm amongst friends. I've really tried not right. to uh, <laughs> tried not to travel on holiday by air for for about uh, 13 years now. It's a lot easier if you live in Europe, and, and I don't have family spread over, so so I'm cheating. Um, but other people do it in their own ways. You know, people of vegetarianism, or you. But I think that much more important for me is um, something that has been close to my heart for 18 years. I'm a video phone geek. Um, I literally am. I have studied video telephony, broadband communications, and, and the ability to have uh, transport substitution for 18 years. And I would like to, to, to say to this audience, I think first of all, the technology companies could be climate change companies. They've become obsessed by smartphones, and they've stopped even bothering trying to get a fiber optic cable to our homes. Mm -hmm. And they've stopped also trying to deploy video phones because they can't make money out of them. But I think that it's time to gently, what's that word, <laughs> with some steel, uh, demand that we are the last generation that does this ridiculous amount of travel. Because uh, it is a delight to travel around the world on holiday or whatever, or to meet friends and family or, or occasionally. For, but this commuting thing with uh, thousands of people stuck in their cars, I know if we're clever, we can get over that. And just a small stat, US citizens spend $850 billion annually moving themselves around. Mm -hmm. And I'd just like to suggest you probably spend five times or 10 times more on your car than you do on your broadband, but you probably spend at least five times more time on the internet than you do in your car. So that is a huge commercial opportunity for somebody who gets it right. So how, that's, that's great. No, that's a very creative idea for all of us to think about. How do your clients respond? You have clients all over the world. So how, how are you effecting that? It's, it's a big and complicated thing. I think that um, one of the reasons that we have broadband, for example, in, in, in well, sorry, one of the reasons we, we've got things like water and electricity and gas and sewage is actually because the state did have a role in saying that we're going to do that. You know? um, and so I think there may be a role for regulators to say, you know, 
actually it's going to create a lot of jobs to, 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 to put all that cable in. That's not a bad thing, and we're going to do it. And if you just look at somewhere like South Korea, you can correlate, correlate their broadband uh, adoption with GDP growth. So come on, you know, this is the USA, you know, Google, <laughs> Apple, come on. <laughs> Compete with South Korea. That's a, there you go. But yeah, it is an extraordinary difference. So Marcella, what about you? How do you, in a personal sense, um, think about your carbon footprint? I know. I also feel the contradictions of you know, on the one hand, working towards coming to a carbon neutrality in the work we do, and on the other hand, forced to have to do a lot of other things like travel, coming over here from half across. We did a little work in our organization because one of the projects that we were studying was how do we work towards carbon neutrality within the villages? And then my team, my, little, my young team said, and what about us? And I thought that this was something that was really very meaningful. So they came up with a little list of, you know, each of us had to put in what was it we were you know, doing in terms of the way we travel and the way we use the water and the way we use the various you know, other things that consume so much and uh, you know, emit so much of carbon. And we had a day together where we shared what, we were, what was happening. And who were, the biggest, uh, uh, who were the biggest producers of the carbon and who were the less and how would we do, do something towards it? And then we said, now, for all the carbon that we are producing on one side, we need to go back into the villages and plant the trees there because we had to take some action. I have to say that we decided at that time that we would come back again, and that was maybe a year ago, a little less than a year ago. We have not yet come back to do it again. And today I would like to say, it reminds me today, thank you, Roberta, for asking me, it reminds me, when I go back, I must nudge our, our young team again and say, please ask us the question again. Because it will help us in a very tiny way. We can't, we don't do that much, but if we are asking the rural communities to make a change, I think we felt that we had to do it by action. No point in preaching, but you preach by action. So that's my commitment. I would like to say that we would like to go back and do a little change in this way. Thank you. And Paul, you, you are consulting with beautiful corporations all the time. How optimistic are you about getting to the kind of change that you want to see between now and Paris 2015? I think we have to understand the conservatism that is built into the existing business system. Existing cash flows protect themselves. So governments can't pass laws anymore. In the EU capital of Brussels, there are 22,000 civil servants and 30,000 lobbyists. I wouldn't be surprised if DC is, is somewhere similar. Now, that, is, that means that, yes, you know, the existing, there can be no change. But um, actually, it's this group, uh, the investor group, that has the choice. And I'll give you one wonderful example. Um, uh, uh, Grantham, Jeremy Grantham wrote in his newsletter in February that he'd had a a second drive in a Tesla three years later. He had an iPad moment, he said, and had a wonderful drive from New York to Boston. They didn't need to stop, but they stopped at the one charging station between New Only York and one. Boston. Between one charging Tesla. station. Between. Yeah. Meanwhile, the oil and gas industry spent $650 billion last year trying to recover oil from more and more uh, difficult and problematic places. And Carbon Tracker and Sarah's have done wonderful work in this area. Uh, my point is that we have choices. Shell's capital expenditure in the last three years was greater than Apple's profits in the last three years. Let's pay out those dividends to the investors and let the people in this room decide which are the industries of the future and not rely on the, on the fossil industries to, to keep going the same way. When you talk about 30,000 lobbyists 30,000 lobbyists in Brussels. What's the high math on that per legislator? I'm a math challenge journalist. I just imagine this person going to work with one and a half people following them. You know. <laughs> so, um, Christina, what are the, um, the actionable items that you are seeing at the Rockefeller Foundation in terms of moving? I mean, you're also, um, your other bandwidth has expanded into oceans and fisheries and 
also involves climate change in a very big way. Um, expand into the oceans for us. Sure. Uh, and, and interestingly, here's where I think corporates also can, can make a difference. Um, we, we've been looking at the issue of fisheries collapse over the past year. Um, and it's, it's almost as depressing as climate change, I must admit. I really know how to, how to pick them. Um, it, it's severe in many places of the world. There are places that used to be very productive fisheries in the Philippines that I visited that were great sources of, of wealth for the community that are now barely subsistence level. Um, but what we're seeing, fish is one of the biggest, uh, it is, I guess, the highest value food commodity that's, that's traded um, in the world. And it, I, I can't remember the stats off the top of my head, but it's a huge amount of money. And the seafood industry is seeing this collapse, is feeling the pinch, and is motivated to invest in, in improving and putting in place the proven management measures um, that are needed to allow fish stocks to rebound. The challenge is this isn't yet reaching these investments that they're willing to make isn't yet reaching the small scale producers um, that, that are the majority of the world's fishers. And so what we're looking at is how can we bring these models of corporate, good corporate behavior, retailer commitment to sustainability and certification, um, Marine Stewardship Council and other sorts of certification schemes down to small scale fishers um, and, and enable them to benefit and put in place the measures that they need to be able to have healthy fish populations from here into the future. And the nice thing about it is for many species, if you give them a break of a couple months to a couple years, they can bounce back and produce more money than they did before. Um, so it's about how do you bridge that gap. A question for all of you is, you know, how, um, I did all these stories for years about greenwashing and about zingy advertising programs, the money spent there versus doing the real sustainable, relevant, you know, do it, doing it right and, and not pretending. Um, I'm, I'm curious in terms of how optimistic you are in terms of um, we don't want to leave people with despair. We want them to know that, yeah, we all need to roll up our sleeves and, and um, in whatever bully pulpits we have, either as uh, shareholders, investors, NGOs, corporate sustainability programs. Are you optimistic that we're going to get there in time? I know, Paul, you talked about declaring war. But, um, all right, we won't talk about war. Let's talk about opportunity. Well, I, I personally am very optimistic because I think that the we, we're only just getting to know the, the, the modern corporation. Um, it's a very new thing. I think it's a bit like a life form. <laughs> I'm not entirely sure it's completely under human control, but it's very, very responsive to external stimulus, um, both in terms of brands. Um, you know, Oxfam have done some great work with behind the brands, for example, making people really understand you know, brands are very, very sensitive. Um, and also, even when you have a company that doesn't have a public face, it's on a stock, stock exchange, and it's, it, you know, that glorious kind of accountability of the public company. I think Burley and Means in the 1930s said, you know, the, the corporation, you know, the, the sort of shareholders have gone off to these exchanges and management have, have gone into their control groups, and that clears the way for society if it can articulate its, its ambitions in a clear way to, to once again have the corporation serve society. So that vision makes me very optimistic. And what about what you see with millennials? Um, the new crop of young people coming up who will be the next leaders, shoppers, investors. What kind of patterns are you seeing them? I think there's sustainability in their DNA. I mean, I'm, I'm staying in Airbnb for the second time. I mean, it's, it's I'm in someone's house. I'm like, I wonder if I could look at their book, you know? <laughs> it's fun. And I mean, if we, if we, if we kind of trust each other and, and then you maybe use social networks to support that, then, you know, we can have a much better quality of life without digging more stuff out of the ground. The, we live in wild times here. I would love to know how many of you have used Airbnb rather than the Hilton Hotel? Really right. nice show of hands. And how many of you have used Uber? Yeah, there's some radical, yeah, <laughs> there is some radical innovation out there. We want to make this a conversation with the audience as well, because we know that you have opinions out there and questions. So um, I don't know if there, is there a microphone, Susanna, or just people shout it out? 
David has a microphone. Okay, who has a question for the panel? Yes. And please just say your name. It's not on. Yeah, we need that sound up. Um, well, I'm Helen Wildsmith from the um, Church Investors Group in Europe. And before asking my question, I'd just like to thank all the ICCR members for making me so welcome this week. Um, it's been fantastic to be here. And, and that really is the background to my question to the panel. Um, I think it's so important that this huge moral challenge calls us to work across borders, whether those are um, geographical borders, generational borders, sectoral borders. And I'd just like to know what the panelists' advice is for people who are trying to work across borders and build collaborations. Thank you. A collaboration question. Marcella. A, uh, Christina. I mean, sorry, Christina. Um, yeah. Great, great question. I, yes. I would say, um, just, just to pick up on the previous question a little bit about optimism, I'm incredibly optimistic. And I mean, maybe somewhat foolishly, but, but I, I think you have to be. Um, but I also just see so much change happening. I mean, the word resilience wasn't on the map in terms of climate change really 10 years ago. Um, when I started working on this. And now it's, it's that people look at me like I was crazy. And, and people now, um, it, it, it's, it's everywhere. And I, I think there's also power in the words that we choose. And at least on the resilient side, to me, that's an optimistic word. It's, it's, it's positive. It's empowering. Um, and so I think we need to spread that optimism. And maybe that's one suggestion for building partnerships. Start from a, start from a position of, What's the world that we want? What's the vision? Um, and what can unite us? Um, and then also to start with respect um, and really uh, honoring the, the, the different people and different perspectives that, that have to come together in tension and, and negotiation, um, but really listening to one another, one another, offering ideas, accepting ideas, and out of that messy mix, um, usually really good stuff uh, surges. And Marcella, you are also world class at collaborating. Talk a little bit about that. Well, we realize that if we have to really make an impact on the ground, you know, talking about the rural communities and getting, <coughs> making a change there, particularly that it is 70% of India is out rural, we cannot but do it in collaboration. And I know one of the big challenges in India is to work with the government. We decided that if we, the government, if we are not working together with the government, we cannot have a sustainable future. And even though we don't always agree with what happens, we try our best you know, to bring in that component of having our say over there and showing and proving that it can work. And then working to, towards, uh, together with the government and all the other partners, you know, because we realize we can't take it alone. We can't do it alone. We need the funds. And we believe very strongly in partnerships. Because, and each one bringing to the table what is their strength and expertise. Those who have the funds, those who come from the big picture, the researchers, know what's happening at the global picture. We know what's happening on the ground. We bring what is from the ground to this picture. You know, and over here, we begin to realize that there is a lot of common points. And each of us, when we respect one another in this partnership, it becomes a very, a very uh, you know, hopeful way in going forward. And I would say we have to a lot of optimism and hope despite the change, despite the problems we face. And being an, an organization that works on the ground, our only expertise is that gap between the rural communities and all the other experts. So it is here we may bring the scientific community. We bring the governments. We bring the various, you know, the teams working in biodiversity. And we bring all of them, the Indian Meteorological Department. We have memorandums of understanding with all these groups. So it finally becomes our work where we see some good results. It gives a lot of hope to all of us. 
I, I'd like to double click on uh, something that Christina said in terms of words. And words create worlds. And so the questions that you ask frame the story that you tell. And so for, like, from my deficit-based questions always about what's wrong to thinking in a more appreciative inquiry about what's the strength in the organization or you know, how, how do you ask the, the questions that need to be asked in a respectful way um, so that you can collaborate with um, strange partners sometimes or difficult partners. What are the words that, that you use to bring about collaboration in talking about climate change? Yeah, that's an that's a interesting question. One of the things we've learned through our work on resilience um, in the past few years is that the word is difficult to translate. Resilience has different nuance and different meaning in different languages. And, and so you just have to go with that meaning and go with the entry point that's, that's afforded with that. Um, but, but one of the things we learned early on um, is to really start with a visioning exercise. So for instance, in the city of Surat, India, when we started work there maybe six, six years ago, the very first workshop we held was, what do we want the city to look like? What do you want the city to look like in 2020? Um, and brought the Chamber of Commerce and, of course, the local, local authorities, um, but also urban core groups and, and various others to the table to have equal voice and equal say in what that vision was. Um, and what was interesting is, is they often did turn to us and say, oh, well, tell us what we should be doing. Tell us what we should be preparing. And you know, this was my first time in, in, in the city. How would I know? I'm, I'm not the expert. Um, and, and so it's, it's really about valuing and respecting the vision that, that citizens have, helping to empower them to, to, to believe that vision is valid and possible. Um, and important, and then bringing together, okay, what are the resources that we have to, to create that, that reality? That we all want. And, and often it's not uh, huge, you know, sometimes you're talking infrastructure and it's huge resources, sometimes it's not. We've seen very low cost interventions have, have really significant um, impacts. Um, and I can talk on and on about that. But Give us one little stuff. example. Um, so this is from a city in Vietnam that, uh, that we have been working with where they looked at their vulnerabilities and, and looked gender, uh, took a gendered lens to it, so asked men and women separately about what vulnerabilities they faced and found that female-headed households um, faced the most damage in, in typhoon season. Um, they often had the roofs ripped off, all of the, the household assets destroyed. Um, and so the women's society there created a revolving loan fund to do simple upgrades to the houses um, to, to withstand typhoons better. Things like tying down the roof better or raising the plinth of the, the, the house so that, less, um, so that it would take a higher flood to create damage. Um, and uh, the city, Da Nang, um, uh, had two typhoons hit last, last uh, typhoon season. Um, and all of the houses that were upgraded through this fund that was women helping each other, women helping women to, to do these upgrades and to afford them, um, all 250 houses survived the typhoons. That's a great a example. Amid a, lot of, a lot of disaster. Yes, great example. And, and impact it's, it's not rocket science. It wasn't yeah. a solution that was parachuted from, from outside, yeah. but it was maybe a, a conversation that was created. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Nice. Thank you for that question. Next question. Please say who you are. We can't see. Sure. Ah, there we go. Yeah. Um, I, I was quite taken by. Well, I was quite taken by Paul's comment about you know how to how to work with how you know, the, the nature of corporations and you know you outlined very well. Uh, that corporations are very responsive to you know shareholders like us, and also to customers through their brands and their image. And you know, one of the other characteristics of corporations is their uh, you know innate drive to grow and to get bigger. I was hoping you give some thought about how we can you know how we as shareholders 
can encourage to grow in the areas that actually uh, benefit and halt climate change, you know, growth uh, in areas of energy efficiency, for instance, um, and in, in growth that doesn't involve um, generating more stuff and more materials, sort of dematerial of things. And I um, said so that we can, we can take this sort of innate drive operations and, and channel it in a much more useful way. Thank you. It's a thoughtful question. Paul, do you want to take a crack at, at that tension between yeah. companies needing to respond to sure, get bigger? And sure. I mean, I have no confidence in the idea that uh, GDP must be correlated to digging more out of the ground. That's just completely wrong. Um, you know, Airbnb can grow, and that means we might have, you know, no hotels built uh, for the next 10 years. And that would mean, and, and, and you know, I mean, I'm, I don't know exactly what happens to GDP. There's lots of people who are in jo jobs in cleaning, and, you know, the, the, the economy has constantly migrated. Shifting. You know, horses, yeah. everyone used to travel around on horses. They don't do that anymore. <laughs> Did the economy shrink or grow? You know, whatever. The point is that um, dematerialization and localization are probably themes. And actually, corporations aren't. You know, they're not, the management are not rewarded on how much they dig out the ground, they're rewarded on profits. Mm -hmm. and, and, you know, there are so many examples of fantastic profits being made from, uh, fr from people simply exchanging ideas. I mean, Facebook's a $50 billion company, doesn't even produce one ounce of product. Mm -hmm. well, we are living in a time of radical disruption. Airbnb that you have stayed at is bigger than Hilton now, yeah. Um, these are amazing and magical times. Um, and you know, we didn't talk about food um, other than at, you know, in rural communities, but what about the local, <coughs> locally grown food movement also? Uh, I can share with you the story that I did on Whole Foods where I noticed that they were bringing in a lot of food from China, although they <coughs> advertise locally grown a lot, and there were pages of foods from China, so I tested some and found some nasty pesticides that are illegal on ginger in America, or even to, aldicarb is a pesticide you don't want on anything. We've got to make it fun. You know, right now, nobody thinks climate change, for example, is important because $500 billion are spent on advertising. And you know that the, the advertisers, actually, at the moment, I think they're firing blanks, okay? What do Five, you mean? Well, the, the adverts don't say anything. You know, this is better because because it is. You know? Well, some of and, them. And I mean, there's an advertising movement really to do good storytelling. Yeah, also. but here's the there's thing. Like, if we have the good products and the good adverts, my dream, my dream is that the adverts are more interesting than the TV programs. You know, and then don't don't so that's so who knew? You know, yes. It, it won't it won't happen tomorrow. But you know, if if we head in that direction, we should you know recognize we participate in a big global democracy through how we spend our money, and it could be a fascinating world actually. Yes. Well, one of the fascinating things about this world is the transparency that we have now, so that... Um, Which you have led. Yes, we are getting information from all over the place, and you all have smartphones in your pocket, too, with um, cameras in them, and so it's a whole different talk about disruption in the news media. That's why I'm not in it anymore. I mean, it's like a failed business model. Um, all right, another question. the Sustainable Investments Institute. Hi, Paul. Um, uh, so CDP uh, has been really good at getting companies to work together with investors and creating this sort of essentially a ratings model to get the companies to compete. On the issue of lobbying, I've, I've, I've done a fair amount of research on sort of corporate political spending in both elections and lobbying. Um, companies spend about 90% more on lobbying than they do in elections, and just do the math, that's a lot of money, as you've pointed out. So I thought the connection that CDP has been making between climate and lobbying is very interesting. I've noticed your questions are proliferate, pro, eh, proliferating on that. But CDP is also good about getting companies to be champions, and we don't have corporate champions for lobbying disclosure and for not lobbying uh, to protect their interests in, in, in fossil fuels. Um, what's the outlook, uh, what's your level of optimism for getting some corporate champions to lobby our recalcitrant uh, lawmakers to change? 
Well, very briefly, I'm not sure that we've really um, got the resources to kind of champion those, those organizations we'd like to try. I do think we, we are planning, it's in consultation at the moment, it's not confirmed, but we may well ask all companies in 2015 if they support a global deal to keep under two degrees centigrade and what they're doing to support such a deal. But I would encourage you, you know, you, you, we actually seldom meet companies. You often meet companies and representatives of companies. I would encourage you, CDP is like an Olympic stadium and we, maybe we've got gold medalists in the corners that we didn't know. Maybe you can and shine a spotlight on them and, and get them to take credit and lead others uh, to follow. Inspire others. Yeah. Um, another question? Yes. Yeah. Sorry. My name is Linda Sarsour. I'm the executive director at the Arab American Association of New York, and I'm very honored to be here. My question is about, and I didn't hear this much, about the intersectionality between climate change and war, and, 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 and climate change being both a catalyst but also a result of war, and knowing the expenditure that our government, specifically here in the United States, and the investment that we put in war, and the result that happens in rural areas, in countries like right now where airstrikes in Syria, on oil refineries, um, and most often conflict is kind of veiled in you know national rivalries, ethnic, religious, but really in fact it's about resources and grabs and energy and who, who controls what. So the question is how do we really connect the dots uh, on that and when we're lobbying for our government to invest in climate change, how, do we, how are we also lobbying against war? Because for me those things are hand in hand. Um, and I think a lot of the corporations who might be doing corporate responsibility and climate change might also be the same corporations helping to lobby towards, you know, interests in resources in these places around the world where climate change is impacting the most vulnerable and most poor communities. So I'd love to hear your thoughts about war and climate change. Very thought-provoking question. Um, Christina? Yeah, that, that, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a really interesting question. Um, and, and there are many, many who think that um, and, and good data, I won't just say many who think, that, that show how conflict really breaks out because of resource scarcity, conflict over resources. Um, you know, one thing that came out in, in one of the communities we were working with and talking with the police, high, hot summer nights are a trigger for violence, so that's another, another sort of linkage to think about. And then you introduce the issue of war causing destruction and, and, um, and, and sort of uh, greater CO2 emissions and, and kind of a, a perpetuating cycle there. Um, these are these are hard issues to to really tackle, and they're very interconnected. And there's lots of other factors that that affect them. But I think talking about them together actually makes a lot of sense um, in in our advocacy efforts and in in those that we have access and influence um, with. So I think that's a great idea. It's, it's tricky because you need to kind of explain the logic. Um, but I think it's instructive to do so as well. I think that's a great idea. How do you connect the dots effectively on that? <coughs> I'm just a brief thing. Climate change is the shark. I think water's the teeth. And you know, some people would say ISIS is a, is a little bit of a product of Syria, where you know, some of the North African changes, you know, water and food nexus, um, it's, it's a mess. But it's a mess because we don't connect. And on the rural side, <coughs> in the countryside, we realize that the, scarce, the resources are getting scarcer. There's less opportunity for work, even in agriculture, when in areas where uh, the, weather, the weather patterns are really seriously affecting communities, and we have large ecologic refugees. Mm -hmm. I'm shifting a little bit from the war. I don't know. I cannot say much on that. But I'll bring it to this area of conflict. When we have ecologic refugees moving to the cities, when we have rural youth who have some education, but they don't have the possibilities what the city youth have, and this causes a lot of conflict, and that together with the increasing temperatures, which is really triggering a lot of, uh, you know, the increasing temperatures is, in, is reducing the tolerance of people. Mm -hmm. And that is another factor what we have realized that is affecting the, uh, the ability to tolerate one another in the summers. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. No, and I have to say it, it is true, it is laughable. But when we have our summers that are extending, mm -hmm. when we have higher temperatures, and, and harder tempers, and harder, yes, 
and really the tempers are up. Mm -hmm. Then we flare up for little or nothing, mm -hmm. and that then perpetuates a whole different type of intolerance. And when you're hungry, you're angry. That's right. Mm -hmm. And when you don't have work, what else do you do except flare up with one another? So how do you bring, I mean, such a, a provocative, good question in terms of how do you bring the peace and climate change together? Because it does, you know, climate, climate change is also causing a lot of conflict and, and of all kinds. So how do you get our leaders to, I mean, is it the storytelling of it? How do you get people to understand that? I'm thinking of within the climate convention, back to Christiana Figueres' uh, always wise words, um, there's now a discussion of loss and damage. So yeah. there are countries in yes. the Pacific that will disappear and are yes. talking about how to relocate their entire population. And they're starting, you know, populations, huge populations in Bangladesh, for instance, that are starting, starting to say, are we going to be compensated for this? We didn't create this problem, not the bulk of it. Mm -hmm. We're doing our best to solve it, but are we going to be compensated for the losses that we feel? And I, I, I think ethically and morally, um, engaging in that argument and, mm -hmm. and, and playing those arguments out is, is important. And that's why I'm glad it's being taken up by, by the convention. <coughs> it's very politically contentious. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, but very it, relevant. But very relevant, and I again, I think it's it's something that deserves airtime mm -hmm. and being um, heard out. Mm -hmm. Actually, sixty minutes did a very good story. On, mm -hmm. on, yeah, the loss of land and yeah. whole cultures that are interrupted <coughs> that will disappear where they are. Um, next question. There's okay. Yes. Thank you. Um, Margaret Year with uh, Everett's Financial, and uh, perhaps a good follow-up to the peace question. Uh, the three of you have done a great job providing us some examples of positive sort of uh, responses in this area, uh, uh, on this topic, and you can't deal with this topic very long without touching on the topic of divestment. And I guess I'd like to know from each of you um, what your response is to the value of the divestment campaign going on. Is it helpful in the fact that it sort of generates attention and has certainly really lifted visibility on this issue in certain quarters, or is it in the long term destructive because uh, A, for the, for the combative atmosphere that tends to surround that sort of topic, whether you're an investor or, uh, or a company, uh, and, and also the fact that it sort of glosses over the, the, the real hard stuff that many of you have talked about, the, the, the nitty gritty that, that, that really leads to transformation of economies. It sort of puts out this sort of silver bullet concept that somehow if we just get enough momentum going, all of a sudden everything's gonna be okay. And when it really takes uh, getting down in the weeds and solving some of these problems, that takes the engagement that often the simplistic solutions that you hear in a, in a divestment argument doesn't doesn't uh, realize. So I'd like to know which you know which mm -hmm. one uh, do you think? I mean, because it, it could be helpful as well. Really good question. In terms of divestment, is that a constructive option? Paul, do you want to? My own view reflect? is it, it, it's simple. And therefore, it gets people talking and thinking, and that's and a good thing. Storytelling. You know, the, 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 the principal threat to national security of the United States is actually probably corporate lobbying against legislation. Mm -hmm. Kids will go to school, and they'll learn about the Congress and the legislature and all this kind of stuff. But actually, they're realizing that they probably should be studying investors, institutional mm -hmm. shareholders, corporate boards. Yes. That, just that conversation, I love. Yes, it's beautiful. <laughs> Civic engagement. Uh, just one nuance, though, to that. I, I think it's, it's generally a, a very good thing, and, I'm, and I'm, I'm very proud that we've divested, and then Rockefeller Brothers and many others um, in, in our peer group as well. Um, but, but I also think there needs to be attention to the climate resilience or climate adaptation side of things as well, which often isn't a part of that conversation. So, so there needs to be a parallel conversation um, to, to give it more completeness and nuance. Um, and Marcella, do you have any thoughts on no, no, about that? I'm okay. sorry. No, but nothing. <laughs> I'm limited there. <laughs> All right. All right. Um, I think one last question. I'm sorry, but we are running. We're not standing between you and the cocktail hour. I've been told. <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, Maureen Klein from Pirelli Tire. Um, well, first of all, I wanted to mention that this survey you were talking about is a Nielsen survey called Thank you. Doing 
Nielsen, um, yes. What is it called? Doing, doing well good. by doing good. good. And what was the and number? The, it was over. It was 55 percent. But the main thing about that survey is that it's going up very fast. So yes. consumers are increasingly with those millennials um, wanting to. Yeah, yeah, with the millennials exactly. Um, but my question is about a carbon tax or a carbon price. Whether that is an idea that's catching on, and I mean, obviously, there's the issue of governments not being able to do anything. But um, is there a lot of momentum around that? Do you, how do you feel about that? Would it work? Um, could it work if it's done in some places, yes, in other places, no? And any perspective on that? Carbon tax, what are your thoughts on that? You know, I, I kind of have thoughts, but they're not very authoritative, and I don't want to sit here for, for hours and, and, and talk to you about You won't uh, be allowed to. You only have you a go. minute. And what, I, what, I, what I think I would say is that um, you know, we're putting dinosaurs in our in our in the gas tanks of our cars. You know, this is not yes. the future, really. Um, and you know, every time you know, if there's one thing that kills jobs, it is this reliance on fossil fuels. If you want to re reimagine the economy, that is going to be the biggest job creator there's ever been. And without going into the details of the policy, I think it's going to be fought out over the over the over the corporate system. And I would say that that. Like the fiduciary duty, for example, that, that, that's like civil rights. Fiduciary duty is a huge concept that is, that is going to be explored over the next decade. And I think you know, if we, we get to a situation where we say we're going to cut greenhouse gas emissions, as Secretary Figueres so, so excellently asked us to, and she has a wonderful office now ready to work with all of you on this kind of thing. If we're going to cut those greenhouse gas emissions, then we're going to need to pass laws. And they may be different in different countries. They may be different in different states. But we're going to have to pass them, because this is a valueless pollutant. And we can't do it by magic. We need government now. And we need investors to support business, to support government, to get us out of this mess. Great. All right, I want to thank Marcella and Paul and Christina for a lively conversation.